All right. Hi. It's Thursday at 1 o'clock Eastern Time, and this is Higher Ed Live. Today we are talking about social network analysis, a management and communications tool that is catching on in corporations and colleges who seek to understand how information and influence work within their companies and institutions. Higher Ed Live is part of a network of professional development webcasts and podcasts. All episodes of Higher Ed Live are free and accessible to you in the archives at higheredlive.com and on iTunes. Today's show would not be possible without the support of our sponsors. Higher Ed Live is sponsored by M. Stoner, a marketing and communications firm that works with higher ed institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and more. Higher Ed Live is also sponsored by Omni Update, the leading web content management system provider for higher education. The company's web, CMS OU Campus, is secure and scalable with great tools and features, deployment flexibility, and an awesome user community. Last but not least, Higher Ed Live is sponsored by Terminal 4, a digital engagement and web content management built exclusively for higher education. The T4 platform enables universities, colleges, and community colleges to achieve all of their online goals, including driving student recruitment, retention, alumni fundraising, and research promotion by maximizing the effectiveness of their digital and content strategies. One of the best parts of being live is that we get to interact with you. Live viewers can be a part of our broadcast right now by sharing insights and asking questions on Twitter using the Higher Ed Live hashtag. You can receive weekly updates with live show dates and times by subscribing to the Higher Ed Live newsletter. I'm your guest host, Susanna Williams. And today, my guest is Zachary Johnson, CEO and founder of Cindio. Cindio is a startup based in Chicago that works with organizations around the country and the world to help them better understand how information is shared within their organization. Today, we are discussing social network analysis and how this tool is helping higher education rethink internal communications. Zach, I'm so glad you could join me today. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Excellent. Um, would you start by just sort of explaining to our audience what social network analysis is? Absolutely. So um, social network analysis, first of all, it's very fun. And it's a really practical and useful uh, science that's sort of the uh, weird child of several different academic disciplines. So you have sociology um, and communication studies, but you also have um, also, it's sort of a, an influence from engineering and, and computer science as well. And um, network analysis is all about understanding how um, relationships are created, maintained, and then ultimately dissolved. And what's what's interesting is when you think about um, the social sciences or, or, or sort of statistics in general, we tend to look at like people or agents and systems as being pretty independent, right? So like you'll look at if you're measuring an organization, you're going to look at um, you know people's tenure, their experience, uh, how long they've, they've, they've been working on particular projects and their outcomes. But from a, a network analysis perspective, uh, instead of just looking at people alone or at organizations alone, you actually look at the relationships that connect them. Which makes a lot of sense if you think about how people work or how communities work. We're not lone wolves. We operate in systems where we're dependent on one another, and you have all this, all this, these interactions that can dramatically impact um, how things happen. And network analysis is particularly engaging, I think, for organizations because it takes like both sides of the spectrum. So like your right brain, left brain folk like it because you've got theories that are really intuitive, right? So for instance, when you think about why people make relationships, for instance, like proximity is a huge factor. Are two people close to each other, right? Think about all your friends that you have that you've met growing up. Most of them are people you live near, or a spouse might be someone who lived in the same city as you. So proximity dramatically increases the chance of a relationship. Or someone like homophily, you're more likely to interact with someone if you have something in common, right? If two people both like uh, the same sport or the same type of movies, they're just more likely to be friends. Um, on the flip side, you have a whole bunch of pretty complex analytics you can run to um, actually map, measure, analyze, and, and compare uh, networks, both static and, and over time. So you have metrics around things like influence, 
So similar to how Google measures page rank for sites on a Google search, you can actually look at influence of people. So who are the folks who um, dramatically control the flow of information in the community, who can reach the most people the fastest, who are the folks who the most connected to people in turn connect to you for advice. And um, when you mix those two together, you have a tool set that's really powerful, especially for understanding complex systems and for things that are um, oftentimes difficult to wrap our heads around intuitively. And network analysis has actually been around for quite some time. So if you think about one of the first network analyses that was like popularized was there's this gentleman in the 1930s who tried to map New York City by hand. So like all the people who lived in New York. And it was just drawing like who connects to who and how and who was related to who and all that stuff. And um, they, it was actually on the front page of the New York Times. I'll, I'll have to find the, um, the, the article and send it to you at some point. But what was cool was there was this idea of, hey, wait a second. There's data here that like exists in our heads and in space and in real life, but we're not grabbing it. So since then, you've had uh, primarily sociologists for a while trying to use this methodology, study different communities. And you'll see there's network analyses done on all sorts of different domains. So you have network analyses done on companies, which is what we focus on, uh, or, or large organizations. You have network analyses done on, um, there was a great paper on um, uh, the networks of punk rock musicians in the UK in like the 70s punk rock heyday. Like, it's awesome, right? Really cool stuff. There's, um, the food chain is basically a social network. Uh, there's a great one that's done where you have the network of senators co-sponsoring bills, and it actually mimics almost in like perfectly the network of cows licking each other on the pasture. Like, can't make this stuff up. So it's really cool because you see this phenomenon happening in different areas. But one thing I will add that's really exciting about networks, and then I, I promise I'll, I'll uh, end my long-winded answer. But in the early 2000s, a gentleman named Duncan Watts. Uh, started doing a lot of work in networks. He's a large systems guy, did computer science work. He did runs uh, data analysis and in, in, um, in, uh, like R&D at Yahoo. And um, it sort of got folks who were into physics and chemistry and other super quant heavy domains into this idea of, wait a second, network analysis can help us solve a lot of problems on our end, but we can also do a lot of cool research. So what used to be like a small network sociology thing, we might be looking at like, you know, maybe like a couple hundred people or, you know, a couple thousand turn into, well, wait a second, let's take a, like a more big data approach and look at millions of people and hundreds of millions of nodes and, and, and billions of edges. And it's allowed to bridge the gap where you can look at really large organizations, track a lot of stuff over time. And um, it's, it's cool because network analysis has broken in the mainstream a couple areas, but people just like don't really realize it. So like Google, for instance, with and any search engine is a network analysis tool. Or like um, uh, when you look at power grids, like a lot of electrical engineers do networks because power grids are very similarly run where it looks at, like, is there a particular part of the grid where if it was knocked out, it would shut everything else down. So it's a similar approach. Uh, epidemiologists look at like similar approaches to network analysis where you're looking at the state of modeling the spread of Ebola. It's a network problem. And in network scientists, we use diffusion models the same way you'd model the spread of a disease. So there's a lot of like overlap and bleeding together of different domains around networks that make it an area that's really exciting for new research, really exciting for people who are, who are um, just dabbling in the space. And also you have a whole new generation of folks who are network scientists, uh, researchers, and practitioners who are really taking this domain and applying it to like, the types of problems we're talking about today. So how does this apply to higher education? Great question. So there's a couple different ways that it can apply. And what's, what's cool is network analysis is a methodology that can be applied to a ton of different problems. There are a few that it's best suited for. So one of the best ones is um, just uh, uh, getting the lay of the land in a community. right? So when you think about a community, if you normally just hop into one, there's all these different players. They have different roles and relationships. And you kind of have to sit around and watch for a while to get a sense of things. But even then, you're only seeing it from your own point of view. Uh, Doing a network analysis allows you to get a snapshot of who's in the community, who talks to who, who gets advice from, whatever relational data you want to collect. So you can really quickly see who are the key players, who are folks more on the periphery, are there any gaps or knowledge opportunities, and um, that allows you to kind of get an assessment of things. Uh, additionally, it allows you to prescribe uh, metrics and in, 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 um, uh, comparable statistics for individuals and groups. So if you think about you have an organization with you know 500 people, 
different people have different numbers of relationships with each other. Sometimes it's based on their role, sometimes it's based on the, the, um, their personality, stuff like that. Networks would allow you to really quickly compare each and every person to see who are the people who are um, in the middle of things, who's overloaded, who has potential to be someone who, who could really connect two groups that are not talking to each other. So you can get down tactically and be able to see you know, who are those people. You can also aggregate all those that information to a group level. So you can actually compare, say you're in a school and you want to look at department by department, which groups have the best trust levels, the best collaboration levels, et cetera. This gives you a way to actually compare and benchmark them. So where we've been focused in higher ed in particular is uh, change is really hard. And organizational change is a challenge for any organization, but it's felt particularly acutely in higher ed for a couple reasons. Um, when you look at organizational change statistics in just the broad um, world of large organizations, there's some stats uh, out there and some research by like PwC and a couple other groups that put change failure rates at around 75%, which is pretty miserable, um, which it's also pretty, um, I would say it's pretty uh, uh, demoralizing if you're the one stuck with doing driving change. But the reason why is, uh, well, there's a couple reasons why, but it's, it's prescribed to a lack of groundswell of support from all the employees in a company, right? And when we talk about change, and I want to kind of, Get let the problem sink in first before we talk about how we do the solution. When you think about change, like changing lots of people, it's like hurting cats. That's the expression that people use. Actually, I think the paper that that research is in is titled "Change: Colon Hurting Cats." And um, what's wild is if you think about change in your own life, like it's really hard. Like if you're a student right now and you're trying not to procrastinate, it's like the hardest thing in the world. Um, you know, I quit smoking. Quitting smoking is like ridiculously hard. If you're trying to go to the gym more, or eat better, or sleep more, or watch less TV, like changing ingrained habits are really difficult. When you're working, it's just as difficult because, hey, you know, this is my job, this is what I signed up for, this is the way of doing things, and I believe this is right. So in large organizations, when like a senior leader snaps their fingers and says, hey guys, we're gonna all do, we're gonna use this new content management system, or we're all going to start putting our, our curriculum online for students who don't come to class, a lot of those those things, not only are they hard to change if you agree with the change, but they also challenge traditional views towards how things should be done. They challenge people's day-to-day -day schedules and the amount of work they have to do, and they can dramatically impact um, someone's uh, feeling towards their organization. So what often happens in, in, in organizations is you'll have like a change management team that get some change agents and maybe they'll, they'll, they'll kind of pick those people based on volunteers. They'll figure out maybe where's some resistance in the org and they'll kind of roll it out. And this is why most of the stuff fails because they don't know which groups feel which pain points, right? Like some, some groups may be totally gung-ho and then the change team's overselling why the change happened and a bunch of people are already convinced it makes sense. Then you'll have another team that's... be preaching to the choir, right? So as uh, an organizational leader, you tend to go to the same people who you... you you trust, your networks, the people you know are going to get things done right. or the people you know are going to agree with you and it's much harder to address the, the opposition and in a lot of ways, you know, the times I've been in a leadership position, I've known who the opposition was and I avoided encountering them because right. I didn't want them to throw up road, roadblocks and yet in higher education as we are needing to pivot uh, due to financial pressures, due to enrollment pressures, due to just the, the changing landscape, um, which is reflected in social media, among other ways, where students are expecting a lot more direct communication, we can't avoid the people who oppose because there's a revolution happening. And our job as change leaders, wherever you are in your institution, is to figure out how to make this be successful. We can't yeah. afford to have it fail. I, I, I would agree, but I would make one adjustment. And the adjustment yeah. would be that, so I, I had a, early in life I was lucky I got to meet uh, this gentleman who had done a ton of um, conflict management work and really just like, like he did work in the Middle East and in Ireland and like all these places where like conflict resolution seems impossible. And what's, what's interesting is um, I find in organizations, like we actually don't really think of change as like, uh, like, like an opposition versus the people who want it. Like what we tend to think of is just like there's like a risk factor. And, and you have people who are relatively low risk because it doesn't impact their jobs that much, they get it, they're already behind it, et cetera. Higher risk people, it's not about them like having a view that's wrong or, or, or being negative or blocking or whatever. It's usually like everyone wants to accomplish the same things. There's just different views on how it should get done. And most of the time in organizations, we find that risk comes from a couple things. One, there are too many changes happening at the same time. 
and they're already advocating for another change. So they don't want to split themselves too thin and lose on an initiative they really care about to support something new. That's a big one. Another one is um, they don't understand how it's going to impact their job or they have false expectations of how much work it's going to be. So there's a lot of like, a lot of it's just like, it's almost like marketing, right? So helping to figure out, all right, what's this going to look like? How's it going to change? And then oftentimes orgs that are pushing those changes, they don't actually take the time to listen to their constituency. Because a lot of times those, those people who have to change have really good feedback on, hey, wait a second, you really haven't thought about this consideration. That happens a lot with technology. So we well, are absolutely right, and in, in institutions themselves need to change for all those reasons and many more. Um, where network analysis can help is by mapping and measuring both influence, right? So influence in an org around communication, collaboration, information sharing, trust, all these relationships that impact like the adoption of new things. And then layering on top readiness information. So like a traditional change readiness assessment that like you know, a Towers Watson or one of those would do in a, in, a, in a large company, you can see not only, you know, which, 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 which groups and which people are, are, are lower risk and higher risk, but how that compares to influence. Because if you think about it in a community, this stuff, it's, it's a social, social factors take shape. And there's tons of research on this. Like uh, Nicholas Christakis and, and Fowler did some work in uh, framing him around how, like, obesity and, and, and happiness and stuff are contagious. It's the same thing with like listening to music or watching Game of Thrones or, or what have you. So when you compare the two, you can now see which departments are influential and ready to adopt. Those are groups that if you start with, they're going to be really highly visible. They're going to role model change for the rest of the organization. And um, they're going to really be like a kind of a beacon of, hey, this is, this is working and this is where, what you should look towards. But if you have an influential group who's less ready to adopt, maybe they're focusing on three other changes, they can totally stop in its tracks because if people are looking and saying, hey, wait a second, these folks who we always go to for everything, they're not paying attention to this. We probably shouldn't pay attention to it either. So when you do the network analysis, you can actually build out a roadmap to systematically roll out change, to, to gather information after the fact, to check in on how it's going, to know how to market which aspects of change to which groups and constituencies, so you can bridge the gap between strategically, how the hell do we make this thing happen, and tactically, which particular people do we need to meet with to sway the tide and drive meaningful change in a, in a typically difficult to drive change environment. And I say the last piece because where, where network analysis is particularly valuable for, for institutions is education is one of the hardest places to make change happen. You have more so than any other organization, departments which tend to interact with silos, which makes sense because back, you know, 50 years ago, they didn't need to interact all the time, right? You didn't have interdisciplinary research the same way you do now. You didn't have um, as, as much um, uh, uh, connectivity just in communication in general. And additionally, you have faculty who, by virtue of their jobs, just can operate alone way more than almost any other type of job out there you know, in, in corporate America and other nonprofit spaces. You have your job, you have your students, et cetera. It's your job to teach and educate. So oftentimes you do have more of a lone wolf type organization, um, which at scale can be really hard to change. So tell me a little bit about the process of how you do this analysis. It sounds like you talked about big data, and obviously there's a technology and a scaling component here that makes this much more feasible for an institution to do. Um, back in the old days, you used to have index cards that you would write down and yeah. ring from index card to index card. If you even took the time to do a thorough sort of stepping away from your daily work to investigate. So how does this happen? Yeah, great question. So. It's cool because it's evolved a bit, like you said, where even, even five years ago, it would have been really taxing for an institution to do this um, because you had to, there weren't the third-party tools and whatnot. What we focus on doing is it's pretty much like a, a it's a multi-step process, but it takes about a month to go from zero to actually having the data you need to work on this, which is pretty good in organization time. Um, and the first trick is you just need to know where you're going to get your data from. And data in a uh, network analysis can come from virtually any source, which is really cool, right? Because, well, you, you still want to get attribute data from people, so like their tenure, their uh, grouping, so what department they're in, et cetera. You do really need to focus on that relational data. And what we find is that, you know, while it is possible, and a lot of companies who do network analysis focus on digital data, so like email or stuff like that, what we found is most effective for uh, higher ed is actually a survey-based approach where you ask people 
who are the folks they go to for those different types of relationships. And so you're, you're looking at who trusts who, who gets advice from who, who's easier to be a leader. And um, instead of asking who do you trust, because that's really hard to compare, we'll ask for like indicators of trust. Like who do, who do you go to when like you're having just like the worst day at work? Or who do you go to when um, you have like a new technology you want to adopt but you're not sure if like the university will approve or stuff like that, right? Things that can be rolled up to indicate certain variables. And it allows us to do a couple things. First, because you're answering about who you work with as opposed to like, like half the surveys about who you work with, half the surveys about your own views, we're actually collecting a lot of data on other people who may or may not even take the survey. So if I take the survey, I'm going to answer like 10 to 15 other people, you have some data on them, which is incredible. So even with relatively low response rates, you still get lots of actual information. That's kind of on like a long tail where like you'll see a few people have lots of connections and other people have, have fewer. And some people who have fewer connections is not bad. It's just you want to figure out who are the people who kind of have above average roles where you can connect with them to really try and affect change. And additionally, it's really hard to mess up the data or like to have super serious biases in it. Like there are some biases, but like if I take don't take the survey and 20 people say that I'm I'm awesome and they trust me, et cetera, I'm gonna have a really high score. But if I take the survey and say I connect to 10 other people, but none of them connect to me, I'm not going to have as high a score because we really value reciprocity. We can have the 20 relational links between two people. Um, you're able to, uh, uh, we, and, and it tends to kind of go viral in orgs. So like in the schools we worked with, our sponsor rates, rates range comfortably from like 35 to 60%. Um, and we did uh, 16 schools last year, and like the lowest we had was a 20, like about 29%. So That's unheard of as a survey response. People really seem to engage with this. What do you think gets faculty, in particular, to respond to this kind of survey? Um, there's, there's two answers. So the first is you don't really have a chance to provide this type of information about your peers that often. And people take it as a chance to really like, hey, like this person's been awesome. Let's give them some credit. That, that's huge. I can't understate that. And most organizations, and like schools especially, they'll ask their faculty and staff, we want you to collaborate more, we want you to share, et cetera. And they don't incentivize it at all. They don't track it. They don't reward people for positively doing it. So this is a chance to actually reward those things that schools are asking for. And it takes like five minutes. So once someone takes it, they tell their friend, hey, you should probably take a look at this and you might want to consider answering about me. Now mind you, we cap the number of people you can answer about, so it's not like you're going to have you know, each person putting in 500 friends or anything. Um, cap it at about 20. And um, what's the other piece too, though, is, is and this is with faculty, but faculty sometimes are mistrusting of our stuff at first. So they want to see what it's all about. So they'll go check it out. And what's funny is oftentimes they'll get like an angry email before someone take it, takes it, and then afterwards they'll take it and they'll apologize. Um, that's <laughs> happened a couple times. But um, it's, it's, it's fun and it's, it's powerful because we then collect the data, build the dash, and then give it to the senior leadership team and they can get working pretty much right away. Um, I, I will mention, though, when we can get like attribute data or outcome data, it is really powerful. So seeing like our new faculty engaging in the community as much as faculty have been there for a long time, right? Are there certain faculty who are at risk of retiring who are absolutely critical to the organization? I mean, that's the type of stuff we look for, too, because, you know, and I'll give some examples later, but we've seen organizations where someone critical is about to leave and, the, you know, they had no idea how big of a different impact it was going to make. So can actually you talk about that implementation? Can you give us some examples from the fields to give our audience a better idea of how this actually gets applied in higher education? Yeah, sure. So the tool that we, we ultimately give give uh, our, our customers is it's a dashboard that lets you go from the bird's eye view, so seeing like all your org-wide stats, and then you have like group profiles, for so profiles from every department, um, grouping of employees like faculty, staff, et cetera, and then also for each, each, each person. And the ones at the each person level uh, show limited data compared to the group level. So just like some basic stuff to give you a sense of if you're going to meet with them, where's it going to cascade, what other groups they have connections to and stuff like that. Um, and then you can see, like, you know, like you have a group finder to compare, like, all right, if we're going to focus on, you know, problem area groups, how do they rank up? And where this is mostly being used is it's being used as an input to existing workflows. Like, our leaders aren't taking this and saying, oh, my God, we've solved, like, all of our problems. We're going to go, we're going to keep these people and give them raises and lay off these people. It's not like that. This just winds up being another information input into the stuff the university or college or comprehensive is already doing. Right, so for instance, um, uh, uh, cross-department initiatives. 
are these departments actually talking? Is it reasonable to expect they're going to be able to get started quickly? And if not, who are the people who already bridge the gaps between those groups we can get in a room to reduce the time to success from like two years to like maybe six months? We're seeing stuff like that. Or um, a lot of institutions have strategic planning like once a year, whereas in, in corporate organizations you have like a whole line of management who's always strategic planning. There's kind of a happy middle, medium somewhere in the middle, but in, in institutions you have strategic planning and this is being used to figure out, well wait a second, are there people we're not including in this process who are really critical to the social fabric of the, the institution? And the answer is like almost resoundingly yes, like we're totally missing people who are key. Um, Another one is looking at, you know, are there some problems we've had historically that where, where the cause is communication? Sometimes you'll have like, you know, we're having leadership troubles in, in, in a particular department and you'll see like oftentimes in those organizations you'll have a leader who hasn't built the relationships they need to to really know how to best run their department. In which case that leader can be then linked up with people who've done it successfully before and start to build out their, their resources. Um, a great example of one that I think is really fun is um, there was an institution that had pretty low, pretty low um, connections between departments. Like they were really siloed, and they knew they were really siloed. And they had all these plans to do it, but they're all like capital intensive plans where it's like we're going to build new buildings or we're going to, you know, take everybody out to lunch or stuff like that. And what we started looking at was, wait a second, who are the folks who are already doing this? Let's see what they're doing right and mimic it. So we went, we like typed up a list, like all right, who are the people who have the highest broker scores? Brokering being the people who connect otherwise disconnected groups, right? And we found out that the, the most connected person was a, a work study student. Like they, they wound up appearing in the analysis because, you know, we don't map students, but because they were technically also an employee, right? And um, they were going to graduate in like a year. And they had, for some reason or another, built a bunch of relationships across from whatever they were tasked for doing in their job, and they were going to leave in like a year. And they never would have known otherwise. But you had like serious administrators clicking this person and being like, yeah, this is like one of the people I communicate with like to learn about stuff on campus. And, so, um, you know what, the action step was taken by the institution to address that? Because that sounds like a, almost a crisis point. Like once that work study, study, work study student left, you know, or if she got reassigned, all of a sudden she was the connector. So uh, do you remember what they did? Yeah, yeah. And what's cool is most of the action steps are pretty common sense like. So there's nothing like magic about her, you don't have to analyze a thousand different things. I mean, you just call that person, get them in the room, have them start talking about their relationships and what they're doing right, and then get a couple other people who are in roles that should be able to bridge those gaps to adopt some of those behaviors. So like, you know... Because if you the work study, it should be someone who is a faculty member or a staff member. Absolutely, and staff or administration is actually preferred sometimes. Maybe a combination of those, simply because like, I mean, faculty are super busy around teaching and super teaching focus. So the trick is to find someone who can like navigate the organization and, and needs to a lot. So someone who maybe um, is driving change across the org or, or what have you. But what's key is you need to have these bridges built before you drive change. Because if you drive change and these people are already talking to each other, you're going to get success here, but then it's never going to reach here organically. Right? It's sort of like if, um, you know, like if an artist was really huge in Boston and then you wanted to do a show in Texas and like there was no word of mouth about this band, you're going to show up in Texas and no one's going to go to your show, whereas in Boston you might have sold out. So it's, it's, um, it's about building those inroads before you need them to have a really agile and adaptive organization. We see it time and time again. To give you an example, in the corporate world, we had an organization recently that uh, does like R&D work and they operate as a holdings company and they have all these different like um, R&D groups that are solving similar problems around packaging. What's crazy about packaging is packaging for like, you know, like pet food and like um, toiletries is like similar to it for like food, right? And what's, I mean, just there's a lot of stuff that like keeps things like preserved longer, that the same technology around injection molded plastics and stuff like that can be reapplied. So we're looking at this group of like 500 people, and we find there are five people who account for 35% of all intergroup relations. Which is like, are you, are you, are you kidding me? That's like, and, and three of them were at risk of leaving. Nuts. And two of them, they were haggling over like $5,000 in comp. And it was like, wait a second, you guys are preaching innovation, sharing, and transparency, and like connected, uh, connected R&D, and like you're going to get rid of the people who are actually like living this. So it sends the wrong message to the org, which is, hey, wait a second, why would we do these things you're telling us when we're not, you're getting rid of the people who are doing them. So it's powerful, but it's something that's not unique to higher ed. 
but higher ed can, can take this methodology, apply it, and basically develop the capability in it before they really need to act on it. Well, and it helps higher ed to get smarter about something that we as administrators do all the time anyway, which is figuring out um, who to talk to, and Absolutely. we're dealing with complex change constantly, uh, but really kind of fumbling in the dark right now and making best guesses. And what this analysis allows higher ed leaders to do is to actually put some um, metrics behind that and to have some transparency into their organization. So yep. who are the people who are most uh, likely to use this? Who is this most useful for? That's a great question, but it is a moving target because what we're finding is it's useful for lots of different people, but you typically... In cases, like a different, you know, this role at a college versus this role, like... How yeah, for different roles, typically the way we've been doing it right now is the chancellor and provost pretty much control access and they'll task a leadership team to deal with it. So a lot of times where I'll come in is I'll actually sit down with like an entire leadership team and we'll go through this like kind of group by group and I'll, I'll kind of shut up and they'll start, I mean the power of this is you can combine the intuition of your current leaders with pretty objective data and what's powerful is I think social data can be kind of subjective in some ways where like the, the numbers aren't, but what explains the numbers can be. And if I just see a random dash from an institution, I can tell you a few interesting things like, oh, you might want to take a look at this group or that group. But if someone has been in that org for 10, 15 years can say, hey, well, these groups never talk because they're in two different buildings and their parking lots are different. So there's no reason why they never meet each other because we also don't do social events. Well, that explains why they don't talk. It's not that they don't like each other. Oh, they think that they're both dumb. Like there's just there's perfectly logical reasons. Like you know they just never even had an opportunity. So what we tend to do is the the the, the higher up in the organization, the more it becomes part of the organization's like leadership mandate and strategy and culture, and it aligns. And also the data can be fairly sensitive. Like you know if some if in, if a group has a lower score, it's not necessarily a bad thing. We don't want everybody to have access that someone freaks out if their score is lower. Um, a lot of times like. You have groups that should have lower scores, like, for instance, you know, um, like facilities management isn't going to necessarily talk to you every single dean once a month because there's not really, a, you know, there might be a reason for it, but depending on the institution, you know, we, we map like everything from part-time staff, full-time staff, faculty, etc. So you you want to see dispersion. If everybody talks to everybody and everybody has high scores. It means your organization is dramatically inefficient with communication. So there's sort of a balance you're you're striking. And um, that's kind of the art part that, that comes in. So uh, that actually reminds me of another issue that I've encountered at other colleges I've worked in, which is information choke points, where you have to go to one person specifically for everything, and yeah. they if they're out of the office, you can't get answers to questions. Does little, social network know. analysis help to identify that? And then um, how do people address that? Yeah, it does. And what's interesting is, is it does in a couple of ways. So first is like like structural equivalency. Like you'll just see some people have very similar networks, and you actually rank order like everybody in terms of like who's kind of closest to one another. And um, so you can see like are there some people who no one else is like, which can pop up. Like oh, they have a network that, that no one else has, which is unique, and you might want to double check just to make sure that they're not at risk of leaving or they're not overloaded. Um, the other thing too is just this is used a lot of times to explain to those people that even though they can kind of be Superman, it's not always the best thing, right? So like a lot of times what happens with our stuff is you have organizations where everybody knows a certain thing's happening, but people don't feel comfortable talking about it. Like it's, it's, it's funny, I have a, uh, I'm very lucky, I have a, a, a Dutch coworker who's extremely direct. When he thinks something's wrong, he tells people, hey, like this is wrong. But in the US a lot, we tend to be pretty passive when we talk about, hey, like, you know, if there's a problem between two groups, instead of just dealing with it, lots of let stuff fester, or you know, it, it gets political, and, and that's really no good for organizations. This takes all that soft, squishy, intangible stuff that we all know is there and matters, and makes it tangible so we can look at it and put it on the screen. So, if you have a few people who are bottlenecks, you can literally sit down with them and show them, hey, you've got 65 people saying they come to you for information on X. Like, like you're badass. But like, do you have time to do other stuff? Like, are you happy at work? Like. Are you getting time with your family? What are you doing? And they're like, yeah, you know, like honestly, I am pretty overloaded. Like, absolutely. And you're doing it in the context of this person has twice as many connections as the next closest person, not in the context of, hey, you look like you're overloaded because you have bags under your eyes. So it, it just 
it, 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 it's taking the data, putting it in a different way, and using it as a context for conversation, which makes some of those difficult conversations that normally people aren't as comfortable having something that's very natural and also really helpful for the people involved. It's sort of like, um, you know, if someone's in the wrong role, they're usually ten times happier when someone tells them and then they actually get into the right role. The trick is broaching that, that, that topic. That's interesting. There was an article in the Harvard Business Review today about criticism and how um, directly criticizing someone shuts them down and immediately puts up their defensive mechanisms and they're less likely to be responsive to the thing that you're criticizing them for. And what I'm hearing you say is that using the social network analysis, you're actually able to point out people's strengths and cool. say, you are an incredible connector, um, but I wonder how this is impacting you and your workload and your life. And um, it, does the tool also allow you to identify people who could be mentored or supported into becoming those people? Yeah, absolutely. So it all depends what data we have available, but we do this a lot. Um, we've done this more in for-profit than we have done in, in, in higher ed, um, but it's possible to do the data we have in higher ed, just institutions have focused on some other things a little bit more. The way that you do it, though, is you look at, all right, let's say we have scores like collaboration scores, trust scores, change readiness, et cetera. Who ranks really high in these areas, but is of a certain age, of a certain pay grade, or um, of a certain um, uh, tenure of the organization? So a great one would be like, let's look at, uh, say you're in a university, let's look at like, um, uh, like an assistant professor, or associate professor who's been here for less than five years who has really, really high scores. Like that's a person you want to make sure you don't have leave by accident. Like, I mean, that should be involved in the conversation of like, hey, is this person going to be a, a lifelong member of our institution? So what's cool is organizations looking at this are, are, are starting to recognize that, you know, output is important. Obviously being your eight teacher is important, but being a, a, like a, in the corporate world they call it corporate citizens, of being an institutional citizen, right, is valued and it really adds an X factor to an organization that when you have lots of people like that, you tend to solve problems faster, you tend to have better open dialogue, and you also have just better outcomes for students and, and you know, for, for whatever your, your business is. So that approach of slicing and dicing by those, like, um, typically like HR type data with, in, in comparison to the network stuff is really powerful for finding those high potential employees. You've talked a little bit about different kinds of influence. I think the word influencer is thrown around a lot these days yeah, so. around social media. And uh, people tend to think of it like if you have a lot of followers on Twitter, you're an influencer. But yeah. uh, is that what you mean? Like a lot of yeah, connections, so. does that alone make you an influencer? Influence can be a loaded term sometimes. We use it at Cindio kind of in a broad sense. We're talking about structural influence. And what I mean by structural influence is by virtue of where you are in a um, – a network, like if you have lots of lots of relationships to other people, or if you're connected to other people who in turn have lots of relationships, it can give you power, right? But it depends on what type of um, uh, 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 what type of relationships you're looking at. So, for instance, if it's a relationship of just like who knows who, and you happen to know two people who don't know each other, you can introduce that, right? But if they're not sharing information with you, you just know each other. It's not like you're going to be a great information sharer. So when we talk about influence, it's broadly like the, uh, the, the um, folks who tend to have lots of connections, who tend to have lots of connections to people who also have lots of connections, who tend to lay on the shortest paths between other people. So think of a game of telephone, the folks who sit exactly in the middle. It can go either way as opposed to being on one end and having to go right. Um, those, that's how we think about influence, but then it, it just it carries different subtlety depending on what the data is you're mapping. So I hope that answer works, but it's... it's, yeah. it's so it's, what are some of the subtleties? You've talked about um, there are, I think, brokers who... There are different roles that people play in terms of yeah. influence, and all influence is created equal, essentially. So yeah. what are the kinds of influence that people can have? So there's a few different types, and we... we all the stuff we do, it's based on published... Uh, published lit and, and research in the network space, but we actually take them and like mix and match them into metric cocktails. So a couple like the basic ones I'll start with are like it's like degree centrality. It's how many connections do you have, both connections from you to other people and from other people to you. It's just that's like your Twitter followers. So your your degree on Twitter is your followers plus some people you follow, right? In degree is how many followers you have. Out degree is how many people you follow. Um, really kind of brute force metric. It's how many people can you reach directly. Uh, closeness centrality. That's like how many, um, are you the shortest number of steps away from 
the most number of people, basically. So like, if you want to reach lots of people really fast, but you don't have to know all of them, it's can you get the word out pretty quickly? Uh, eigenvector centrality, it's similar to how Google does page rank. So I have high eigenvector centrality. If lots of people connect to you and say they get advice from you, but you get advice from me, right? So if, if uh, uh, the New York Times that everybody links to, links to your, your, your website, you're going to have a high eigenvector centrality and a high page rank. So those There's are a couple There's like curation in that, that you've identified something that is worth sharing and you're, you're a filter, you act as a filter for other people who are connected to you and they trust you as a person who is going to direct them to good information. Yeah, yeah, like you're an expert's expert. If all the experts go to you, then like you must really be an expert, you know? Um, the, what we tend to do is mix and match them. So like a lot of those, they correlate, right? And like, so like brokerage is between a centrality. So, you know, do a lot of connections between other people who aren't connected pass through you. So like that correlates with eigenvector centrality, correlates with, with degree, et cetera. So what we do is we'll mix and match them. So like we'll have someone be an information spreader. That's someone who can reach lots of people really quickly, uh, either through other people, directly, um, and across groups. So it kind of combines three of them with a certain type of relationship. So it gets pretty complex pretty fast because we're also looking at, we're looking at types of relationship, like whether or not they're present, um, strength of relationship from how people answered in the, the, the survey, uh, frequency of relationship, so things like different things we asked about you can look at through digital data too. So it's like by the time you're done with a score between two people, a lot of thought went into it. And um, it's pretty robust. Uh, it's really fascinating, and I can see a lot of institutional implications for it. But what are some of the risks that are associated with this? You're asking people to share information about other people, and that automatically brings up privacy questions. Um, but what are some other concerns that people have, and, and how do you address those? Yeah, so obviously there, there, there are risks with any, any technology you bring into an organization, any approach you take. Um, let's see, so the first one is just like, I would say like transparency risk. Like we always advocate for the people we work with to be really transparent about what you're collecting, why, how's it gonna be used, et cetera. And like if you put a veil up, it's just gonna hurt credibility um, or people won't trust it. What we find is that most organizations, they want to be held accountable for these things anyways because like most people tend to value things like sharing and being helpful and stuff like that. And all the questions are positive, so it's like, it's a pretty friendly exercise. Um, but if, if, if an organization's like about to go through layoffs, they send these out and don't tell anybody what it's for, like that's, that's, bad, that's bad leadership and bad timing. So, you know, and, and like it's possible to have something like this to make sure you don't fire people who absolutely would just destroy the organization because there'll be no more connections left. But at the same time, you know, you need to run an organization based on the values and culture that your organization's been built upon. So we always advocate transparency. Um, also making sure that employees have a chance to like, get some, some data back, I think, is good. So making a plan to share some data with employees is helpful. We're actually launching a new tool early next year that gives little profiles back to people who take the, the survey. So they get data in exchange for data, and it helps them figure out, like, hey, if you want to meet people in other departments, these are the people who you already know who are the best to get you there. Right, so it's just, it's not like a you need to meet this person because that'd be an absurd claim for us to make at this point, but it's if you want to start going down the rabbit hole of building, becoming a broker, or building out ties, these are some of the ways you could do it really intelligently. Um, and so that's a risk. Another risk too is just over applying the data. Like this isn't, this isn't a silver bullet, you know? Like nothing's a silver bullet. And, and humans have gotten pretty good at managing other humans. I think there's still a lot of work to go there, but like, if you if you combine this with like 360 degree reviews, traditional assessments, looking at like student feedback, et cetera, then you're gonna have a pretty complete picture of like how a faculty member looks. Or if, if an administrator is not hitting their goals but they score high in this, this isn't gonna outrank that. You know? This is just another input that's really, really important that typically when folks are evaluated, it's done entirely subjectively, right? But this provides that extra little boost. So in that case, I feel like we bring a lot of visibility and, and it actually diminishes risk there. But when we do talk to, to folks who are doing this for the first time, we advise like, hey, you can use this for lots of different things, but this isn't supposed to replace traditional decision making. If you're gonna do something a certain way, just use this to fact check. If, they, if there's a discrepancy, then you need to dig deeper and, and get more data for your decision. But like, you know, 
I wouldn't hire someone on the basis of this. I would definitely wouldn't fire someone on the basis of this. But if you're going to staff a team, I would certainly look at this. If you're about to fire someone, I would double to make sure that they're not going to. It's not going to really mess stuff up. Um, it's you know, it's it's the intuition plus the data that's so powerful. Alone, intuition's all right, and the data's all right. But this is what's cool is with our our customers, we're seeing good leaders getting really, really, really good, and we're seeing great leaders become exceptional. And that's the really fun part is when you see someone who's already a good leader get this data, it's just unbelievable the extent to which they're able to see like, oh, hey, here's a blind spot. Here's a group I've been neglecting for a long time. I know I need to go in there now. And it's just like these, these folks figure it out on their, on their own. Once they see the dash, we really just sit back, shut up, and it just happens. Really and it's fun. not only this is a person or this is a group that I need to pay attention to, but these are the specific people that I need to reach out to in that group because that's going to be the most effective use of my limited time. Absolutely. Um, and I'm going to be able to, that's going to just catch on like wildfire. So th as I'm listening to this, it really seems like this could thoroughly upend an organizational culture because once you start thinking in terms of networks, you see the world completely differently. Absolutely. Have you institutions change some of their behaviors as a result of the information they've gotten from this analysis? Uh, we're seeing it a little bit. It's still early to say, like, if it's shaken, you know, shook the bedrock, so to speak. But, it, yeah, I mean, you're seeing organizations who've been talking about doing stuff for a long time beginning to act on it, right? So, like, the organization who has a problem with silos are now building those gaps, those, those bridges, and they're probably, I bet, a year or two years from now, can be one of the top schools we've measured in terms of connectivity between between groups and organization. They're empowering people who are culture creators to amplify that stuff. So I, I think it's definitely going to change. And also, what's cool too is by measuring something, you know, like this is what the I, I forget the, the expression off the top of my head, but the, by measuring something, you're changing it, right? <laughs> and by sending out surveys where people answer about these critical things, they now know it's being measured. It's something that people care about. So they're doing it more. And in organizations where this starts to happen, we do see a culture of, hey, let me actually think about, are we doing this in the most efficient way? Are the right people around the table? Are we considering certain views? So I mean, a great example is like we do a lot of stuff in supply chain, right? In supply chain in, 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 corporate, in, in a corporate context, you have like, actually education is a lot like the supply chain, because you have students who pass from year to year, where students are the product. And they're passed from step one to step two, step three, step four. So step three fails, then four, five, six, seven, eight are going to all be useless. Like we did in elementary school once, and we saw that like when you know grade four failed, the rest of you know test scores dropped. So what happens is they're thinking more critically about, well, wait a second, are we connecting the people who really need to be connecting to provide value? And it, it's a great thing because our organizations are beginning to benchmark it over time. So are they improving year over year? How is it impacting their outcomes? But also, we're benchmarking them against each other. So at least in the cohort that we started with, they're able to see, like, all right, well, are we ready for change more or less than our peers? You know, Do we have resistance in different groups? Are there certain groups that are more influential or less influential than others? So there's really like optics now into how you're doing as an organization where you didn't have before. Because traditionally, when you manage your organization, it's like, well, I was at this organization when I was just getting started. And like I remember like they seemed pretty good. So I think we're doing OK in comparison which is like a super scientific way to run your company, run your, run, your, run your institution, right? But now what we're seeing is, okay, wait a second. We're like top tier in these three areas, but we rank lower in here, but that's okay. But wait a second, we're really low on this, you know, inter, intergroup connectivity thing. I value that as a leader. I need to improve this. Let's see how other groups in our cohort have made that happen. All of a sudden, I mean, especially where, where, where um, you know, some of these institutions are, are less competitive than you might be in other types of organizations, it's really cool because now they actually have a proxy of are we making progress? Are there areas of deficiency? And it's just there's so much more visibility into what this looks like. Which when you think about like how HR usually functions or organizational development or or just strategic management in general, so much of this is done in a bubble. And it's it's kind of it doesn't it's not very empowering, right? And this empowers leaders to actually have stuff to measure around the, the really tricky parts that can make or break their organization. It really uh, formalizes attention on communication and change. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
which you know often as communicators and as, as people who are leading organizations, you think about message, you think about audience, but you, and you think about channels, but you don't really think about the connections between those yeah. and optimizing those. And when you're dealing with internal communications, which is something that I think every institution I've worked in has said is a challenge for them. Yeah. Um, people finding out information, everyone feels like someone is holding on to information. Absolutely. This and really helps people to know uh, as it's an institutional priority that people are committed to transparency and sharing information effectively. Um, do you see uh, in other clients, because it's still, it sounds like it's early with your higher ed clients, but is there a uh, increased improvement in morale on campus, or do people feel more connected and engaged and valued? Yeah, we definitely see that in organizations we work with. Um, I don't have any data on that from higher ed yet, um, but it's you're giving people a chance to provide feedback and input. So instantaneously, you have a sense of okay, people are listening to me and care about what I think. Um, you know, our input really matters. Also, people who normally wouldn't be tapped to contribute to things are now being tapped. So those high potential employees are being brought into strategic planning now, saying, hey, like you're a superstar young faculty member who everybody thinks is awesome. Like, what do you think about our use of new technology? All of a sudden, this person is like pretty bullish on their position in the organization, whereas before they were like, you know, I've met the senior leadership like once or twice, maybe. So it's definitely making strides there. Um, and I think, I mean, it all depends organization to organization. Every organization is its own beautiful little snowflake. And like, it, whether you're talking about like, you know, a Procter and Gamble or you're talking about like a small community college somewhere in the middle of nowhere, like every organization has its own quirks, history, et cetera. So what's cool about this, I think, is it allows the leadership to have that extra boost to if they want to make those things happen, it can empower them to do so in a way that like can seem very daunting otherwise. Mind you, you can have an institution grab it, look at the results and say, like, you know, we don't need this, or hey, we already know all these things, or this is BS, and they can ignore it. Like that's it's entirely up to how it's like any other tool, right? You have to actually use it in the right way, apply it, build a little bit of capability in it. But what we found is in the vast majority of organizations we've worked with, they've gone the former way where it's this is awesome, we want to keep doing this, it builds accountability, and um, we think it, it's, it's a, because the, when you look at institutions, one thing that I love about higher ed are, are in, in, in publicly traded companies, sometimes people are thinking about just next quarter. How do we make our goals, how do we do whatever, and like that, that can work, but I like institutions that are thinking about the next 10 years, the next 50 years, the next 100 years, and having an incredible culture, having an incredible workforce who's, um, adaptive, who can deliver excellency constantly, is, is critical capability if you want to be around for the next hundred years. I mean, if you look at higher ed right now, like, you have organizations just running a deficit. Like, that's not sustainable. So you're going to have a whole bunch of schools that disappear. You're going to have a bunch of schools that combine. So if you want to be one of the schools that's going to last for another hundred years and maintain legacy, you need to deliver excellence in every way possible. And I, I we found that most higher ed leaders see this as a, as, as a way to begin to do that. So in terms of the future for social network analysis and higher education, can you quickly in just about two minutes talk about where you think the potential lies for higher education's use of social network analysis? Yeah, uh, I, think the, I think the potential's in sharing, honestly. I mean, like, so for higher ed, like, this stuff isn't that expensive to do right now, which is really cool. Um, whereas, like, it's more expensive in other industries, you just have a lot more people and it's more intensive. Institutions are fairly self-contained, so like to go from zero to getting the data and stuff just isn't that hard. I think the magic, though, comes from the comparisons between orgs. So if you have data from 400 colleges about like, well, hey, this is how my org works, this is how my peers work, these are the ones that are most similar to me, you start to build cohorts of, hey, guys, you know, we've got all these big pressures coming, and they're, they're coming right now year by year, but it's going to be month by month soon, right? The, the rate of, of technology increase is just nuts. So being able to compare across institutions that used to be islands, like that is crazy opportunity to not only succeed in your institution, but to really change how education is being delivered um, in America, which is which is just awesome. Because if you look at all the challenges that young people face, um, education can help with a lot of them. It can also cause a lot of them that you don't want it to cause. So it's, I view this as one of the many powerful tools in that tool set, but I think I think it's a special one because it takes a lot of the hardest stuff, so that intangible, how do we make people work together at scale piece, and makes it really tangible, 
actionable and something that um, I think can be measured and improved over time. Wow. Well, given that students are not apt to stay in one place anymore, the students yeah. from institution to institution, making sure that the institutions themselves are looking at the same kinds of questions would be really beneficial to student success. Is there a correlation between improved communication on campus and student success that you could even just posit right now? Um, Is that too much of a stretch? It'd be a leap right now. I, I, like, I, I believe it's going to help if, if I'm done properly, but I just that I would be making up data. Um, <laughs> I think that I think that the opportunities there. So, to give you an example, like we did something recently where we had a um, we had a school and we were looking at like alumni giving where and, and it was they like a senior class gift thing where we saw you know can we use network analysis to increase like giving among young alumni and like it worked, which is great. So like network effects can work in a whole bunch of different areas. I do think though that if you have an institution where you empower leaders to be better and you empower employees to be better and you empower um, information sharing and best practice transfer, like it's not like anyone's gonna get worse. So I think seeing results is something that's gonna definitely happen, but that's some one of the things we're really looking forward to tracking over the next, I don't know, five to ten years. So what's the next step for your work with higher education? You've worked with 16 institutions so far. Are you continuing to build a database of information so that you're able to get yeah. some bigger picture ideas? Absolutely. We've just added two more institutions to the to the list. Um, and if anybody wants to do it, I mean, what's cool too is like we're at the stage where we're sort of like we, we're we're doing some like bulk buys where if you want to come in with three or four institutions and do it, we'll cut deals because we like the strengths in the data and also we're really passionate about education. I started this company with a professor. Um, I do spend a lot of time up at Northwestern, like helping to teach networks and whatnot. Like we really believe in this stuff. So whatever we need to do to get that that repository going, the rest is gravy. Excellent. Zach, thank you so much for your time today. This has My been pleasure. a really intriguing conversation. It's very definitely a different way of thinking about communication, connection, and change management in institutions. And yeah. I hope our audience has um, been intrigued enough to do some more research. I'll be tweeting out links to some more articles about social network analysis, and um, you can follow up with me on Twitter at, at Susanna DW and Zach, you're at uh, Zach, Z A C K underscore underscore Johnson. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, thank you, as always, to our program sponsors, M. Stoner and Omni Update. Thank you very much to Zach for spending the time with us today to talk more about social network analysis and how it can be applied in higher education. I'm really excited to see where this goes in the future. I think that higher ed is in a time of immense change, and uh, there's a lot of looking at questions around change. Uh, and to have tools to make actions that are based in data instead yeah. of uh, assumptions is a really powerful mechanism for school leadership to be effective in trying to achieve their goals. Absolutely. It's well, nice. I'm Susanna Williams. Uh, Nicole Lentini will be back on Monday with an all new Admissions Live. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Bye. Thank you.